For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, the traditional territory of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, as well as the Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and many other tribal groups who have lived here, subsisted here, and traveled here to trade and make their living since time immemorial. This podcast is produced in partnership with Rewild Portland, a nonprofit organization and is made possible through financial support from our listeners. The best way to keep the podcast going is to become a recurring monthly supporter. If you feel inspired to contribute, you can make a donation by following the link in the podcast notes. You can also help by sharing our podcast on social media and writing us a review on iTunes. We are exquisitely designed as a species to be eating a diet based on animal source foods, as our ancestors have always done, literally all the way back to the earliest hominins. And as time has gone on, the prevalence of animal source foods in our diets became higher and higher and higher as we began preferentially hunting the fattier and sassier animals. And we became smart enough with our growing brains to develop the technologies to bring down things like woolly mammoths and sloths and giant aurochs and things like that. That was Nora Ged Gaudis speaking, author of the books Primal Body, Primal Mind, and most recently, Primal Fat Burner. She is today's guest on the Rewilding podcast. Uh, while rewilding is not just a diet plan, it is important to study and understand the baseline needs of our bodies uh, so that we can carefully measure the trade-offs of living in a very different world from that of our most recent ancestors. Um, and by that, I mean the Anthropocene extinction and has it's amped up with, you know, obviously civilization over the last 10,000 years. Um, in the Rewilding podcast, I'm going to spend a lot of episodes discussing how humans eat, such as the varying subsistence strategies. But in today's podcast, we'll be talking about what humans have eaten over the course of our evolution so that we can better understand um, what we are most adapted to eat. Before I get into the interview, I'd like to create some more context And I'm going to do that by reading an excerpt from the rough draft of my new book on rewilding that I'm currently writing. Here goes. Evolution is an ongoing process that can be seen and understood through the snapshots of individual living things. This embodiment of the process of evolution can be seen in two ways. One is through DNA a series of expectations that create the makeup of our physical bodies. The other is through the trade-offs and compromises made living in an environment that doesn't fully match the expectations of DNA. In another sense, DNA is who a living organism's ancestors were. The compromises a living organism must make in its own lifetime are who its future offspring will be. And finally, the organism itself is the sum of those parts embodied in the living present moment. While living individuals can't evolve, they are the living embodiment of evolution itself. In this way, evolution can be thought of not just as a concept, but as an embodied process. When I say that DNA is a series of expectations that make up our bodies, what I mean is that our DNA grows eyes because through millions of years of our ancestors using eyes, it is expected that we will need to use them in our lifetime. We have hands because our ancestors have been using them for millions of years up until my grandparents' and parents' DNA lent itself to mine. In this way, 
DNA are not just building blocks or blueprints, but the expectations that sets up our physical body to match the expectations of the environment we will most likely be born into. Every part of our physicality reflects some expectation of the previous humans who lived and died before us. These expectations come from both natural selection, those who had eyes that they used lived long enough to have offspring, and epigenetic triggers are DNA changing based on the environmental conditions. These expectations include what we eat. For example, DNA creates a body to expect to receive a certain kind of nutrition from a specific source. If the environment doesn't match this expectation, the body can suffer across a spectrum from small, nearly imperceptible ways to large, painful ways that could even lead to death. This all depends on how strong the expectation was in our DNA and how different the actual environment is. The best case scenario for healthy longer lives is when our DNA matches the environment we are born into and live in for the duration of our lives. Relatively speaking, this is the case for most living things. We are born in an environment that closely resembles that of our most recent ancestors, and it stays the same throughout our life. We call this being well adapted, and if we are able to eat the things we are well adapted to eat, we call this optimal. Oftentimes, people will use colloquial language to refer to this, such as our bodies are designed or meant or built to be a certain way. For example, eat the food that our bodies were designed to eat or meant to eat. Now, while I have semantic problems using colloquial terms and metaphors that can tend to confuse or misrepresent the evolutionary process, one term I like to clarify is the idea that our bodies have certain needs or requirements. What we are really often most talking about are the needs for optimal living, not the needs for just plain old living. What we need to live optimally, based on the DNA we inherited, might not match the environment that we live in today. This is where compromise and trade-offs in our lives alter the DNA of our future offspring and foster adaptation to a changed environment. We often don't actually need to live optimally in order to stay alive long enough to have offspring. There is a spectrum between living optimally and not being able to live at all. There are needs for optimization, but also just more basic needs for plain old living, even if it's not optimal. This is an important distinction because there are many conflicting ideas around diets out there, and while many will meet the needs to keep you alive, they are not meeting the needs to live optimally, or in other words, to live in a way that our bodies are most adapted to live, to fulfill the most amount of expectations that our DNA has for us. To learn about the most adapted expectations of our bodies, I turn to the expertise of Nora Gedgaudis. Nora is a leading expert in understanding the evolutionary expectations of the human body and specifically the human brain. As a neuroscientist, she has a unique understanding of the brain and body, and how to eat in a way that is more aligned with the expectations of our DNA. Today, Nora and I will specifically be talking about the history of what humans have eaten and how it has shaped our body's expectations in terms of nutrition. Toward the end of the conversation, we spoke a little bit about what we can do to eat this way today. I've got Nora here right now on the line, and I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it, if that's okay with you, Nora. It is okay with me, yeah. You can always edit out the expletives and whatever. I'll just leave them in. I'm going to mark it as, um, you know, explicit on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> just say Nora could get us all say, oh, yeah, this will be unhomogenized and unpasteurized, right? <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, Peter, it's great to be here. It's, it, it, you know, I'll take any opportunity to get some quality time with you. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so um, let's just jump right in and maybe start out with you saying a little bit about what um, the paleo diet or primal diet is. Well, sure. So we need always to get when we talk about these things to get our definition straight, because I think so much of the confusion and misinformation and disinformation around these subjects has to do with how people are defining them. Technically speaking, the paleo diet, and we'll throw quotes around that, really has to do with the type of foods that we consumed as an evolving species during our evolutionary development. And by 
you know, considering all the selective pressures that would have been involved during that process and the and the predominant foodstuffs that would have been available to us as an evolving species, this lends major clues as to our fundamental uh, physiological makeup and also our, more bas our, our most basic nutritional requirements. But there are a couple different versions, actually more than a couple. Frankly, there are as many different versions of what is popularly now referred to as the so-called paleo diet, as there are persons claiming to practice it, you know, and, and that gets to be problematic. Right. What I just stated as a definition is a good preliminary definition, but most of the early people popularizing these dietary approaches were basing a lot of what they surmised to be the ideal human diet or the original human diet on, you know, Neolithic people groups that were able to be, you know, studied and visited by anthropologists and Hadza, you know, tribes and, and you know, in, in, in remote Africa and things like that, that are still, you know, one of the remaining hunter-gatherer people groups still doing their thing on the planet. And the problem with this is that we frequently forget that, you know, more than 2.6 million years of our evolutionary sojourn was spent in a world that was considerably different than it is today. You know, we, we currently reside with it, we still reside actually within what is referred to as the Quaternary Ice Age, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But we just happen to be in a period, and you know, these periods historically have been notoriously brief. There have been very few of them, more than 90%, uh, you know, less than 10% of our evolutionary history has actually been spent, um, in fact, probably less than 5% of our evolutionary history has been spent in temperate climate periods like the one we've been enjoying for the last, you know, 10,000 plus years or so. Right. The rest of it, you know, have been in more aggressive periods and varying periods of glacial advance. While we were an early evolving species in Africa, we we were in one of the more uh, major periods of glacial advance where there were major um, there are a lot of things that come with that, even though in Africa it was obviously fairly temperate. In fact, it was tempered to the point where there were severe droughts and wildfires all over the place that were eroding away the tropical forests and giving way to, you know, the drier savanna. And, you know, we had an intrepid hominin relative that, you know, swung out of the trees and onto the, onto the savanna and stood upright and developed opposable thumbs. You know, the first uh, species of which was Australopithecus afarensis, which, you know, the remains of which were were that were found that and, and found to be about 3.4 million years old were dubbed Lucy. They they named right. it was a female skeleton. They found they named her Lucy. And although she evolved a long, slightly different hominin line, she was the earliest hominin, you know, able to stand, walk around on on two legs right. and and all that kind of thing. And uh, she actually used stone tools to cleave meat and marrow from bone, and probably did most of her meat eating as a scavenger. We don't really necessarily have a lot of evidence for her actually hunting, although I will point out that even our non-human, our closest non-human primate relatives, the great apes, all hunted uh, and killed and consumed at least some meat. There, in other words, we don't have any vegan relatives. Right. Uh, now, now, herbivorous gorillas would be one notable exception, but they also have a brain only about a third of the size that would be expected of a primate of their size. Mm. So, and they, we, we're not as closely related to them as we are, say, you know, chimpanzees and, right. you know, bonobos and that kind of thing. And they are definitely, at least in part, carnivorous. They're, that makes up a significant part of their diet. However, they're more herbivorous than we are. Right. That was evidenced by, you know, chimp has a fermentative part of their gut that occupies 52% of their total digestive tract. For us, the fermented, you know, which you need that fermentative gut in order to make use of a diet that is largely based in fibrous plant foods. Right. You, know? yeah. um, you need that big vat of bacteria working on it in order to generate the nutrients that you actually absorb because the nutrients in plant foods are notoriously not easily available. They're there, but they're not easy to extract. Mm -hmm. So it takes it takes a fermentative gut and or a rumen in order to make the most of that type of diet. 
but our human colon only makes up about 20% of our digestive tract, the fermentative part of our gut. And, you know, the, the internal wildlife that we have processing whatever fibrous matter we consume um, is largely focused on transforming that into certain nutrients and, and short chain fatty acids designed to nourish the colon and, and nourish themselves and not necessarily the rest of us. So um, we instead have a hydrochloric acid based digestive system. And that is something that we have evolved over the course of our evolutionary process. And we've actually come to a place, um, in fact, according to stable human isotopic studies that were done at the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, we actually were higher level carnivores throughout the vast majority of our evolutionary journey than e wolves, bears, foxes, and other carnivores we, you know, we co-evolved with. So once we became, you know, the very first uh, member of the genus Homo, Homo erectus, by 2 million, 1.8 to 2 million years ago, we already had a full-time hunting economy and animal source foods formed the primary basis of our diets. And, you know, plant foods might've been a side dish, but really animal source foods and that nutrient density that came with them became much more prevalent. You know, we're just designed differently, but but really quick. So, but once we transitioned into the Neolithic, there was, there was a major thing that happened. We shared this planet for 2.6 million years with a 120 more species than we have today of massive herbivores we sometimes call megafauna. And those vanished rather abruptly, I might add, around the end of the last, you know, we call it the end of the last ice age, but, you know, the last, you know, period of major, you know, glacial advance ended uh, with a bang. And it was, it's now been un become understood to be a, a rather cataclysmic event. If you look at, uh, I have a graph somewhere that can show uh, the extinction pattern of megafauna at that time. It all spiked around the same time period. And we're talking about animals in the tens of millions. Right. Now, in the past, it was believed that human hunting, because we always like to blame ourselves for things, you know, there was a handful of Mesolithic human hunters that literally wiped out the megafauna. Right. You know, I have ties to a number of indigenous communities and tapped into the way they view the world. And I can tell you that if ever there was a people group that did not does not believe in waste, <laughs> it's right. it's them. You know, they actually take offense at the notion that they would ever do something so ir irresponsible as to wipe out a species. Totally. And there's also, you know, in terms of uh, running the animals off cliffs, one of those, at least with mammoths, uh, um, I believe, has been disproven through going back and using contemporary age testing methodologies. The sites were actually used for a very long time. It wasn't just... Um, that they would run whole animals off of cliffs, but that, that they would run one at a time for thousands of years. Yes, um, that makes a lot more sense to me. Right. Native American, you know, hunters and indigenous hunters around the world recognized that they had a very different way of viewing the natural environment in which they evolved. In fact, you can't really extricate them from their natural environment. And they recognized that there was a cycle of life and death of which they were a part and that, you know, um, they they treated that relationship with a great deal of respect and reverence and were not the haphazard, you know, bloodthirsty, you know, right, exactly. uh, you know indiscriminate killers that right. they sometimes get portrayed as being so. Right. In terms of the paleo diet, one of the complaints or misconceptions is, you know, people just tend to say bacon on everything. <laughs> well, um, yeah. I mean, so, we, all, we all like to joke about bacon as being the gateway meat, right? right. <laughs> and all that. Yeah. It brings up a point I want to ask you, which is what is the relationship between the brain and animal fats? The relationship is absolutely huge. I, you know, I will point out that the health of bacon depends on the healthy animal that bacon came from and how it was processed or whether it was highly processed, right? Absolutely. And so we can't overgeneralize with bacon other than that it's uniformly delicious. But, you know, <laughs> it's interesting to point out that the highest, just as a quick aside before I go into this, 
the dietary source that is highest in vitamin D3 of any food available to us is actually, you know, pork fat if it is exclusively from pastured, fully pastured pork. Even more than fish? Oh, yeah, oh. much higher. Well, fish in general doesn't have a lot of D. Now, fish liver, well, fish liver oil, actually, even fish liver oil is, is relatively poor in D3 content. Mm. If you see high levels of D3 in, in like cod liver oil, it's been it's been fortified. It's been added in. Mm -hmm. It's not naturally occurring. You know, where you see it, liver is normally it's a vitamin A source. Mm -hmm. D3 is certainly present in the organs and tissues of animals that were allowed to consume their natural diets and in the fats of animals allowed to consume th their own natural diets. What makes pork fat higher is the fact that you know pigs don't have a lot of fur right so if they're allowed to roam around in fresh air and sunshine they get that sun exposure and their bodies generate lots of vitamin d that then gets stored in that fatty tissue there's something that was presented quite a number of years ago that is now widely accepted in anthropologic circles known as the expensive tissue hypothesis what what it what is effectively talks about is the fact that we ultimately traded the size of our guts for the size of our brains. That as our brain size increased, something had to give metabolically, you know, in there. Because it takes an enormous amount of energy to digest, you know, plant-based diets. And it, it just, you know, it takes a highly fermentative digestive system. Mm -hmm. While we were consuming the meat and, and particularly, we developed a uniquely voracious appetite for the fats of the animals that we hunted. And as such, the fermentative volume of our gut reduced and our large intestine got smaller. Our small intestine designed to handle more nutrient dense diets available in animal source foods actually got quite a bit longer. Mm. And we developed a hydrochloric acid based digestive system where we were ultimately designed to get all the nutrients we required from animals that had already laboriously synthesized them for us. And that allowed us to get a greater variety of nutrients that was much less energy intensive for us mm -hmm. to procure. And that allowed for very, very rapid development of the human brain. Mm -hmm. You know, our brains are made of like 80% fat by dry weight. You take the water out. But it's not just that it's all fat. It's the composition of that fat that also matters. And the composition of the fat of the human brain is quite different from that of other primates. What distinguishes our unique human cognition are these 20 and 22 carbon fatty acids called arachidonic acid and docosahexaenoic acid, both of which are found exclusively within the human food supply and animal source foods. Mm. And ours is a predominantly omega-3 based cognition. And in, in great apes, it's predominantly an omega-6 based cognition. Also, 20, 25% of our total caloric energy demands are utilized by our brains. And so it's, they're enormously expensive in energy terms. You know, it, brain makes up maybe 2 to 5% of our total body mass, and yet it's consuming 20, 25% of the total caloric energy demands. You know, uh, maybe the brain weighs a little less if you happen to be a politician or something. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and apes in general don't use more than about an ape's brain won't use more than about 8% of its total caloric energy mm. demands. And so, again, our brains became very expensive in energy terms. And as it grew, we had to find a way to fuel that. It is horrifically inefficient to try to fuel our brains based on plant-based foods. For starters, I don't care how much plant-based omega-3 you consume, you will never produce DHA from that. Now, you may under optimal circumstances, and as long as you aren't, uh, say, Native American or of na a Northern European descent or Celtic descent, uh, and as long as you don't have any precluding metabolic issues that may prevent the conversion or deficiencies, you are lucky under optimal circumstances to convert maybe 6% of the plant-based omega-3s that come from things like walnuts and chia seeds and flax seeds and things like that, Sanchanichi you know, oil, whatever, you're lucky to get 6% EPA from that. And you probably won't get any DHA. By and large, if DHA is not in your diet, then it's not in your brain. And you cannot have optimal cognitive functioning without that DHA. And within animal source foods, EPA and DHA are found almost exclusively in the fat of animals that are allowed to eat its 100% its natural diet. Right. I mean, like even one 
in a feedlot just pumps the the levels of omega threes. It makes them almost non-existent and way weighs things toward inflammatory omega sixes. You also get pu- less beta carotene. Yes, we get beta carotene from meat. Less vitamin E. You know, less CLA. Almost no CLA. In fact, CLA has to be gotten from exclusively grass-fed meat. And that is perhaps the most anti-cancer nutrient in our in our diets, and it's an animal source nutrient. So this is a great segue um, into my next question, which is, in the contemporary time now, like I can get grass-fed meat at the grocery store if I'm lucky enough to be living near a store that carries it, or I can, or if I can afford to buy it, um, which, you know, if I think about it as like preventative health care costs, it might save me money down the road. Um, but one of the things I think about is the future. And we had a conversation about this in person before. Um, but why bother trying to eat in this way that we're designed um, when this society has changed, our environments have changed, and why not just like give in to the change and accept that our diets are different now and we might be suffering some of those consequences, but is it really, you know, that important for us to try to eat like our ancestors? Does that make sense? Right. Well, well, for starters, you know, you're thinking of evolution as so, as a linear thing where everything is getting better and better and better, which is not necessarily the case. You know, evolution isn't necessarily moving in a direction that uh, it, as is popularly advertised or as we would like to think. Mm-hmm. The other part of the equation is that it takes anywhere from 40 to 100,000 years in terms of, of genetic changes for our genome to adapt to a really major change. Now, agriculture was the first major change, and we didn't all universally adopt agriculture 10,000 years ago. Right. If, you're, you know, if, if your relatives came from the Middle East and you know all that, well, then you might be slightly better adapted, but actually there's a lot of evidence that may not be the case, but you know, to, uh, you know, doing more grains and legumes and things like that. But, you know, most places in, in Europe were not adopting agriculture for at least a couple thousand years. And God forbid you're an indigenous person, you know, your grandfather probably was eating uh, an entirely wild diet, right. you know, pre-agricultural diet. So, you know, agriculture has been adopted throughout by our species to varying degrees and at varying during varied time periods. The other issue that we need to consider is the fact that, you know, we have had the industrial revolution now for, you know, no more than a couple hundred years. And the problem with the industrial revolution is that it, it now all bets are off because what we have is a very rapidly changing food supply that involves taking whatever foods that we used to consume in a relatively un- unprocessed manner and and highly processing them and then trying to create new foods out of things we never used to eat before like soy and you know whatever else and now it's kind of like we're trying to adapt to a moving target you know which is impossible right. to do and yeah. God forbid, you know, genetic modification of the food supply and all of that. Right. So, you know, it, it, you know, and also in the face of radically different uh, environmental circumstances, I believe that we live in a far more hostile environment today than our prehistoric ancestors ever could have wrapped themselves around. Okay. You know, they, 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 they lived in a pristine environment with fresh air and, and water, completely unadulterated food supply, nutrient-rich soils, and microbes in those soils that were commensal bacteria with our guts that, you know, kept our internal wildlife happy. And, you know, prior to the end of last ice age, the, the huge, you know, fatty mammals that, that we hunted preferentially to anything else. You know, they say woolly mammoth had body fat, uh, they estimate, of at least 50%, you know, four inches of subcutaneous fat in the tongue and the brain and the marrow and everything else we would have consumed. There is a, an anthropologist, an Israeli anthropologist by the name of Mickey Bendor, and, and he wrote a paper called Man the Fat Hunter, which is a which is a well worthwhile read. Mm. And, you know, he made a very good case for the same thing I'm talking about, that we evolved selecting fat as our primary source of fuel. When... The Ice Age megafauna disappeared, and rather abruptly. We were left with a 
you know, with animals to hunt that were much smaller, much leaner and much more fleet of foot and much more difficult to catch in some respects. But that said, if you really look at, you know, the way Weston Price did, you know, he, he was a, he was a nutritional pioneer that that studied dozens of primitive and, and a few traditional cultures in the 1920s and 1930s that were still thriving. And nobody else could ever replicate what he did because those ways of life are gone. But what he did was he meticulously recorded who these people were. He took samples of all the foods that they were eating and analyzed them to the extent possible with the science available at the time. He took massive numbers of these astonishing photographs of these people groups. And you can just see their faces tell everything in terms of the the radiant health and the the skeletal structure and the really healthy dentition and all of that. So what he found examining all these different people groups eating all these different diets all around the world, right? You can imagine the diet of the Aboriginal outback person was considerably different from that of an Inuit person or somebody in the jungles of South America or on the African savanna, for instance very different foods available to these people. Far too many people, you know, claiming to be adherents to his philosophy, kind of took away from that message that just eat real food and it's all good. Well, I don't think that there's a rational basis for that assumption. You know, it's not rational to assume that just because our ancestors did something, it was necessarily, you know, just because something grew out of the ground and they put it in their mouths, chewed it up and swallowed it and didn't drop dead, to assume that that food was optimal for them, much less us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. I cross pollinate what I look at in this respect with human longevity research to cross pollinate these ancestral principles, which I think are the only rational starting place, and then figure out what of those principles makes the most sense. Well, it turns out that there were two things that Weston A. Price found. He asked himself the question. What did all the healthiest people groups that were the most free from disease, you know, and, and, you know, were the healthiest mentally and physically, what did they all have in common? And there were two things. Number one, tried as he did, sincerely tried as hard as he could to find, you know, a, 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 like an indigenous, uh, what he called primitive people group that was eating a vegetarian or vegan diet. It didn't exist. He tried really hard. He couldn't find one. What he found among the healthiest people groups he ever studied was that the healthiest ones of all consumed as many animal source foods that were available to them in the greatest variety possible. But number two, that was consistent among all the healthiest people groups, regardless of where they came from and regardless of whether it was tropical or Arctic environment, that they, the, the most important food, the most venerated food, the most sought after food of all, the most sacred foods, the foods that were considered sacred within their traditions, were those foods that were highest in fat and fat soluble nutrients. And he actually, and mostly of, of animal origin, not plant origin, except in the tropics, you had a lot of coconut oil and things like that. Mm. But they still loved, you know, uh, the fat of animals. Right. And he also found that the fat soluble nutrient content, certain fat soluble nutrients that can only be gotten from animal source foods like true vitamin A, which is retinol, you know, richest in liver, you know, you can get it out of egg yolks too, but really liver would be the richest natural source was always a, considered a superfood. Vitamin D3, vitamin K2, the MK4 variety were found exclusively within animal source foods. The amounts of those fat soluble nutrients were literally 10 times higher he found in these indigenous diets than in the diets that he considered modern diets of his day, like in the 1920s and 30s. You know, try to extrapolate to where we are now. Right. Oh. It's kind of scary to think about. You know, carbohydrates prior to the end of the last ice age played a comparatively meaningless role in our caloric intake. If you look at the stable isotopic analysis research of the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology. And they found that there was really no evidence of plant protein in those diets really at all in any meaningful way. We would not have been consuming, you know, baked potatoes with our woolly mammoth steaks, right. you know? I mean, who'd have room after, you know, you take down a fat, sassy, woolly mammoth, you've got a family barbecue that's gonna last for a week or more. 
a couple of things that are rattling around in my head. One was I recently interviewed uh, Wonia, who was on the latest season of Alone, where they had to survive in the Arctic. It made me think of your story, actually, um, that you told me once about um, your summer surveying wolves and how you were like basically living off fat because each of the contestants up there, they're in the Arctic they're losing like a pound of de- a day, you know, and they're trapping and they're eating squirrels and rabbits, but you know, none of them are getting enough fat and their caloric intake is just dropping. And so they're losing weight, like, you know, like a pound to a pound and a half a day. And you know, each week the people come out and kind of check on them. And um, if they go, right. certain, go, beser- go below a certain level, they have to evacuate them. The main person yeah. who was able to stay the longest, he was getting like massive amounts of fish, but he also took out a moose and rendered a lot of the oh. fat from the moose and was able to, yeah. you know, keep his body weight up long enough. But even then there was a, a, a wolverine ended up, you know, raiding his cache and eating all of oh, the man, fat bummer. that he had rendered. <laughs> yeah, Of course, uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> right, exactly. It got me thinking a lot about starvation and potential scenarios of collapse. Not that I'm like, you know, doomsday prepper type thing, but it did make me think about transition technology and culture and the needs of the brain and our body in terms of maintaining our weight in a crisis. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Like if you've. um, Oh, yeah. You know, do you stockpile stuff? Do you have like, you know, your emergency rations of things? And then like, what are you thinking in terms of like, how will people be able to get the nutrients that they need in terms of fat in the future as we transition away from, you know, I'm me personally, I believe that our capitalist society is headed for a, a pretty big cataclysm. Oh. You can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. So I'm expecting there to be a massive transition in the next 100 years or so. And I just keep thinking about paleo diet and trade-offs and compromise. And so what do you think about the future in terms of diet and how to prepare for what the world might look like? Yeah, start stockpiling pemmican. (laughs) This is what, you know, uh, Plains Indians and and, uh, North American, uh, you know, Inuit and Arctic people groups as well as Plains groups did for a very, very long time. You know, they they recognized that, you know, there could be lean times ahead and they stockpiled, they literally stockpiled fat, you know, in the form of pemmican. Uh, whole wars have been fought over pemmican, in fact. And, you know, they would render the fat of animals uh, and then add to that the powdered meat and organs of their tissues and mix it all together. Plains Indians maybe use some berries. And I think actually, and our ancestors that were leading a life in the wild, getting a little occasional insulin resistance, you know, had a survival benefit. So adding sugar to fat greatly enhances fat storage in the body, Mm. which, you know, is something that most people do not need so much of today. I mean, I don't care if you're living in Minnesota in February, winter ain't coming for you anymore. You know, we're all living in these 72 degree climate controlled environments in extreme comfort. We don't have to deal with the selective pressures that our prehistoric ancestors faced, yet we still have the same feast or famine psychology, right? Only now we don't have to take more than two steps in any direction to grab a handful of something we call food, shove it in our faces and call it good. (laughs) And, you know, and combining sugar and fat is not a smart idea if you want to be lean. But if you're in a survival mode, you know, a little bit of insulin resistance can go a long way toward improving your energy stores for prolonged potential, you know, food scarcity. You know, this is what I'm, you know, really hoping to see people producing more. You know, you have these doomsday preppers with buckets of grains and crap, you know, in their storage bunkers. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, carbohydrate foods are fundamentally metabolic kindling, right? They are, say, your your whole grains and your beans and your, you know, and your wild rice and your, um, you know, sweet potatoes and things like that. Look upon those things as being twigs upon your metabolic fire. And then white potatoes, white rice, you know, uh, pasta bread, crap like that you basically can call crumpled up paper on that metabolic fire. Sugary beverages, you know, fruits and, of course, you know, alcoholic beverages and things like that largely are akin to being gasoline or lighter fluid on that metabolic fire. Now, if all you had 
to heat, you know, your house with was a wood stove and all you had to fuel that wood stove was a bunch of kindling, you could certainly do that. And metaphorically, this is what 99.99% of modern day society is doing every day. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the, the door to the wood stove is open and you're constantly preoccupied with where the next handful of kindling is going to come from to keep the damn fire going. You know, what is the alternative to that? Well, the alternative is to put a nice big fat log on that fire, right? And then you basically are, metabolically speaking, you're free. It's very long burning, very even burning. It goes a long time and you can rely upon it even in the absence of regular, you know, constant throwing stuff in there. And if, you know, you look down after, you know, you sleep through the night and you wake up in the morning and yeah, there's an analogy there. And then, oh, look, the log is burning down a little bit. I'll just throw another log on the fire. You're basically free. You're able to go about and live your life. You're not having to be preoccupied. You're not having to eat six freaking meals a day. You're not going to be as hungry and you're not going to have to eat anywhere near as much in order to be satisfied, in order to be clear headed, because your brain can run almost entirely on nothing but ketones, which are the energy units of fat that are unique to fueling the human brain if you have a fat-based metabolism, as opposed to a sugar-based metabolism. Most people relying on carbohydrate foods are not more than maybe, you know, two missed meals away from a state of total metabolic chaos. You know, if, if you have eaten, if you have gone without food for six or seven hours, and you're feeling, you know, low energy and cranky and jittery and something that rhymes with itchy and whatever else, that's not something that our ancestors experienced. This is not normal to feel this way. The only normal thing to feel when you haven't eaten for a long period of time is hungry. And then once you've eaten, you're not supposed to have a great big burst of energy and you're not supposed to, you know, want to just sort of unzip your, your you know, your, your pants and fall asleep on the couch. You know, the only thing you're supposed to feel once you've eaten is not hungry. Right. And energy sh availability should be relatively constant. And that's what a fat-based metabolism, which I make the argument for being the natural metabolic state of humankind in my book, Primal Fat Burner. That's the kind of metabolic freedom that you can look for with that type of metabolism. It, it, and it makes sense, doesn't it, that, look, food would have been highly variable in, in its availability to us. But if you're able to tap into, you know, the fittest person listening to this, look, maybe has 100, 150,000 calories worth of fat on their bodies that they could rely on for up to a month if they were metabolically adapted to knowing, to being able to tap into that. Mm -hmm. But people that are, it's sort of like a, one of the analogies I, I use is, um, is that of a, you, know, you see these huge gasoline super tankers going down the road and they've got thousands of gallons of petrol in them, right? And then you see them pull into a truck stop to fill up this tiny little gas tank mm -hmm. because, because they're not tapped into the bigger tank, right? If they could be, they would never have to stop. They could just keep going. And metaphorically, that's what our basic metabolisms are all about, you know, in the carb laden, you know, world. Mm -hmm is that we are constantly relying on this tiny little gas tank that you have to constantly replenish in order to keep going. And God forbid you should, you know, forget to eat or not be able to for, you know, more than a few hours. Suddenly your brain function goes, your energy goes, your mood goes, your cognitive function goes, and uh, it's not a happy situation. You know, that's a very big problem. So Basically, of the three major macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, the only macronutrient for which there has never been a scientifically established human dietary requirement is carbohydrates. Mm. And yet, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's pyramid, you know, no bias there, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be basing our entire diet on feedlot food. Right. If you look at the animals that are actually designed to eat a carbohydrate-based diet, you know, let's look at ruminants and things like that. Cows, sheep, goats, deer, you know, moose, whatever. What are they doing all day long? Their faces are in the bushes, in the grass, in the trees, and, you know, shrubs or whatever. They're eating constantly in order to meet their basic nutritional requirements with a brain, a, a minute fraction of the size and sophistication of ours. 
So, and of course, they rely on the bacterial transformation of all that fiber into the nutrients that they require. And I'll make one more point is that many people will be surprised to hear that a cow gets at least 70% or more of its calories, not from carbohydrates, but from short chain fatty acids from the bacterial fermentation of all the fiber mm. that they consume all day long mm. that are synthesized from that. That's where they get their calories. So mm. even cows are fat burners. Right. All large mammals are designed to really run on fat, only as highly sophisticated human primates with an unprecedentedly large brain. And I mentioned, you know, we use 20 percent of our total caloric energy demands our brains do but in a baby that's 85 percent of their total caloric energy demands in toddlers you know very small children 40 to 50 percent you know you're not going to easily get that from a carbohydrate based mm -hmm. diet and if we're trying to rely on carbs as our primary source of fuel we have to eat constantly in order to meet those metabolic demands you know for an inferior fuel that is only you know that burns hot and very fast and has to be replenished constantly. Mm. Well, who do you think profits when we're having to eat constantly? Mm. Okay, so we have the food industry, we have Monsanto and all the other big partners in big agribusiness, and you know, Albert, you know, so the pharmaceutical industry on top of it. And then you have the chemical industries that generate all the pesticides and herbicides designed to, you know, grow those monocrops. And then you have the uh, biotech industry creating all the GMOs uh, that's turning this planet into the island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> and, and then you have phosphate mining industry that is strip mining the planet for phosphate as an artificial fertilizer. We have the biosludge industry now. We've got, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industries that profit from all of the unnecessary metabolic right. uh, diseases. You know, then we have Jenny Craig and Undertakers making out like bandits. Right. You know, who's the gets the short end of the stick is the rest of us. Right. And these foods are very addictive, a lot of them. You know, I mean, do you think that's why the switch happened? Or do you think it was a response to the minimizing or the extinct extinctions of megafauna? People were looking for other food sources. Like I lean toward the addiction theory? You know, I, I actually do think that we did really latch on to grains once we figured out, well, for starters, they do contain exorphins, which are morphine-like compounds, right. which for many people are highly, highly addictive. Mm -hmm. And then once we figured out we could ferment that crap into beer, the dye was cast, right? Also, it allowed us to stay in one place, not have to be so nomadic. We could just kind of grow this stuff and hang out. And we got greater safety in, in numbers by, you know, creating larger communities of people, which was a total mixed bag. Right. And that, of course, allowed for what we now call civilization, which yeah. also leads to patriarchal hierarchies and, you know, nation states and all that good stuff, you know, and, and also full scale genocidal war, which right. was something that came along as a result of having all this you know, now these big food stores we had to suddenly protect, right. you know, instead uh, of just sort of being in harmony with, with each other and with nature. So I had another question. I, I read a report recently that was talking about how the salmon runs in Alaska were in such a decline that they were worried the bears that live up there weren't going to get enough of a fat layer from eating them, like there wasn't going to be enough for them to eat to develop fat. And what they figured out was that actually the fat stores that they were building to hibernate through winter were coming mostly from huckleberries and other berries that the bears were eating. And even though right. they weren't um, getting as much salmon, they were still able to create that much fat. And it sounds like what you're saying is that that may be, I mean, I mean obviously bears are different than humans, but I'm kind of wondering right. about the, the physiology there, if, if there's anything that, that is similar in that regard because um, it sounds like it kind of matches what you were saying a minute ago about. Yeah, I think our, you know, where we lived, where our ancestors may have evolved in climates that, you know, where there were seasonal transitions that were kind of harsh or where, you know, there were times a year where food was a lot more scarce. I mean, think about it. In late fall, fruit ripens. And by gorging on that, we generate a lot of body fat. Fructose flips a fat switch in our bodies that sends the signal to store more body fat. And that was an adaptation to help us outlive more harsh and famine conditions. 
And I think that that same thing probably also applies to bears, which we know just gorge on berries and, you know, root around. And they have, you know, the capacity for generating greater fermentative nutrients and things like that than we do. And of course, they eat a great deal of carrion and places, salmon and fish. When you're eating fat, isn't likely to pack on fat so much as it is to provide nutrient density and a lot more quality nutrition. But, you know, insulin is the fat storage hormone and the primary macronutrient that stimulates the production of insulin tends to be carbohydrate, you know, like sugary, starchy kind of foods. So in the fall, the berries ripen and yeah, bears, they eat pretty much constantly as they can. But Mm -hmm, if you're eating meat that's too lean, that is a recipe for disaster. You can make yourself completely sick on nothing but protein. Mm -hmm. You have to have fat in order to make healthy use of that protein and offset the protein ceiling that we all have in terms of what's safe metabolically for us to process. The primitive Ice Age you know, peoples and, and, and Plains Indians would have called this rabbit starvation. When they killed an animal, and this is still true, if you go up to the high Arctic and, and these remote communities that can only be gotten to by airplane like Old Crow, uh, the Vuntet Gwich'in people, they still are people of the deer. They hunt caribou. And when they kill a caribou, every last freaking part of that caribou is used Mm -hmm. right down to the hide, the hooves, the bones, the meat, the marrow, all of it Mm -hmm. was used, is is used to this very day. All of it is considered sacred and not wasted. So that is traditionally, you know, how we evolved. And and what people think of as meat today, you know, chicken, fish, and, you know, and, And steak, you know, that's stuff that a lot of indigenous people ended up feeding to their dogs Mm -hmm. because where the real nutrition was, of course, was often in the organ meats and and, uh, things like that. So what do you think in terms of an urban population that's very densely populated, you know, if somebody was to raise animals or something like that in order to feed themselves, like what do you think would be the best trade off or compromise in terms of trying to get fat in just like smaller scale types, like growing it yourself. Yeah, that's really tough. So obviously, you know, if you're talking about a backyard operation, chickens and rabbits are, you know, steps would have to be taken to try to allow for the maximum amount of fat producing, you know, feed possible in those in those animals to improve Mm -hmm. the fatty profiles. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I encourage people to think tribally and think locally, you know, to Get to know your local ranchers and people raising and, you know, learn to hunt and fish and procure food for yourself the way our ancestors always have wherever possible. Or if you can't do that or it's you're not inclined to, well, then make a deal with some friend or family member, you know, that does that where you can get a hold of some of those things. There are lots of inexpensive ways to eat, you know, optimally well in an uncompromising manner if you know where to look. There are situations, too, where people will go out and they will buy a whole cow together. And, you know, that that's been totally been able to live out in fresh air and sunshine and and eat what's natural for it to eat. And everybody then splits the cost of butchering that animal and then dividing the meat up amongst people mm-hmm. relative to their needs or their ability to afford it. That's you know, there's <laughs> right. Exactly. It's a really smart way to go about. Look, if you're you know getting all your meat from like Whole Foods or a.k.a. Whole Paycheck then yeah, you're kind of screwed when it comes to the economics of this. But that's not necessarily the answer. There are farmer's markets in most cities and most places. Or you can go to a website like eatwild.com. Find out who all of the farmers and ranchers are in in your area that are doing the right thing in the right way for the right reasons, right? That are grass-feeding their animals. You can find out who they are. Deal with them directly. I would way rather give them my hard-earned food dollars than some faceless you know, soulless behemoth that is just generating whatever for the sake of profit and not, you know, out of, you know, the best interests of my health or yours. Exactly. My last question is, what are you really excited about right now in terms of your own research? And what direction have you been going in? Oh, man, you know, I'm continuing to find more and more evidence for all the stuff I've been telling you about all the time. And that excites me because on almost a daily basis, if I, you know, as I come across independent research that wasn't, you know, funded by some economic interest 
I find myself increasingly encouraged and validated by all of that. So that to me is very exciting. The popularity of fat-based metabolisms, of course, has sort of, sort of in the last couple of years gotten to an unprecedented fever pitch. But again, what people call ketogenic is just as variable as what people call paleo. You know, I use the term primal to depict something much older, much more foundational, much more primary, you know, to our requirements and to whatever it takes to optimize human health. The term paleo has just sort of gotten tossed around. It could mean anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I've even seen people on peanut butter and banana eating peanut butter and banana sandwiches calling that paleo. I don't know what was wrong with those people, but, you know, I've seen all kinds of stuff and, you know, all the cellophane wrapped, you know, stuff with cavemen right. on the labels. Yes, and totally. and now we have the cookies and cream keto bars. And, you know, it's taking something that has a fundamental sound basis and maybe is the only rational starting place that we have and using you know, the greed and marketing that have come with the popularization of these approaches and turning it into a fad, you know, and I'm moving into a place where I'm divesting myself away from what is commonly termed paleo and uh, what's commonly, you know, termed keto, because 95% of what goes on in those genres is something I just have a very hard time respecting. And so I've trademarked a term that I uh, call primalgenic to basically define what I do mm-hmm. and, and what I'm advocating, which is very uncompromising in its approach. And it will never mean anything other than the meaning I give it, right. you know, because yeah. because otherwise I'm constantly having to try to fit myself like a square peg into a round hole around mm-hmm. these popularized and overly commercialized versions of these things. And uh, I don't want to end up with the same baggage everybody else in those genres is is carrying right now. Yeah. So my integrity is deeply important to me, mm-hmm. and it becomes you know more and more important to me as time goes on. Mm-hmm. And I'm very fussy about what I'm willing to promote or advocate, and it's all based on, you know, not just a lot of you know hundreds of hours of painstaking research, but but and, and decades but also a couple decades worth of clinical experience that I bring to what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity firsthand in a clinical setting to see what works and what doesn't work when I talk about these dietary approaches and what's more likely to optimize your health and what's more likely to compromise it. What I'm seeing too is an unprecedented explosion of things like autoimmune diseases, which, you know, I guess you could say that's an area I'm, I hesitate to say excited about, but I find myself increasingly mindful of because it's easily the least recognized um, and, and, and most urgent health crisis that we have in the modern you know, 21st century. There are more than 100 autoimmune diseases that have been identified and another 40 to 50 diseases that are thought to have an autoimmune component. When it comes to the dietary antigens that can either initiate or exacerbate these conditions, the vast majority of them are post-agricultural in origin. Right. In other words, we're the least adapted to them. Our immune systems are the least adapted to them. But there are also environmental compounds um, that can also trigger and exacerbate these things. There are bacterial and, and, and particularly viral antigens and other types of uh, microbial antigens that can also exacerbate, even if those infections are dormant, these things. So, you know, what it boils down to is that as time goes on, I I see it increasingly important that we recognize that we don't have the wiggle room of our prehistoric ancestors, much less our great grandparents, grandparents, or even our parents, when it comes to what it takes in order to have any semblance of health, much less optimal health. And that we need to take that very seriously. The the number one cause of bankruptcy right now in this country is a bad diagnosis. And you cannot rely upon, you know, those persons claiming to be your health authorities to offer you the best advice, you know, where the motivation for what they give you in terms of advice and treatment may be more motivated by profit than than your best interests. Right. You know, we have to start to take an interest in the machine in which we inhabit 
it, it doesn't have to be at a PhD level, but we have to have some basic understanding. And the more we can do to, to create the most foundational scaffolding, just like what Weston Price discovered in terms of the greatest variety of animal source foods and you know, available, and then making sure that that fat and fat soluble nutrients are a major component of that, because that was a universal, regardless of whether we're talking Inuit or people living in jungles or in you know Aust Australian outback or whatever else. That to me is the foundational basis for the most optimal diet for every human being alive. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's bioindividuality. But look, what defines us as a human species is not our differences. It's those things that we share in common. Mm -hmm. And until we've addressed the foundations of our own physiological makeup and our own most fundamental human nutritional requirements, and yes, there is a human diet, and anybody that says it's different for everybody doesn't know what they're talking about. They're buying into propaganda. There is a human diet. There's also bioindividuality, but that needs to be considered nuance on top of those foundations. You get those foundations in order, and then you address the nuance that maybe your particular, your particular autoimmune condition or your particular deficiency or your particular MTHFR polymorphism or, you know, whatever you might have going on, you know, that may be compromising you that you may need to take extra compensatory steps for. But you have to start with that foundational scaffolding, that really solid foundation, because otherwise, if you're just trying to build your health based on those nuances, based on the, all the bioindividuality, you're building a house on quicksand and, and it will never stand. You, you will never get long term or optimal results from that. So I'm not saying that the dietary approach I'm talking about here is going to cure every disease or prevent every disease. But what I am saying is that it is in fact the, the best foundational scaffolding that you can employ and that you can use to build or rebuild the most optimal health possible yeah. in our uniquely challenging modern world, which I also try to take into account. Right. And um, fibrous plant foods, fibrous vegetables and greens do have certain beneficial compounds. They provide you know, there are large varieties of them that we can use, especially for foraging, to provide dietary diversity, which is critical when it comes to autoimmune in terms of providing diverse fodder for our internal wildlife, you know, our microbiome. The more diverse your diet, but animal source foods count too. The more diverse your diet, the healthier your immune function will be, the more healthfully your immune function will modulate itself, and the less vulnerable you will become to the greatest affliction of our time, which is, frankly, autoimmunity. And sadly, that's all the time we have left for today. And we're just getting warmed up, dude. I know. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry more. to talk at you like an auctioneer, but it's like there's just so much I want to cram in and never enough time. I know. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I feel like there's loads of content. We could definitely do a future episode. Totally. Yeah. And I, I want to encourage people too. I, I have a, a, a program, an online program coming out called the Primal Genic Plan. It's three week meal by meal total health transformation program, kind of a marketing name, but it's basically handholding people through the process of adopting this way of eating in a way that is actually more affordable than the standard American diet. I mean, by orders of magnitude. I know that sounds hard to believe, but it is, and it's uncompromising. I also have my regular website, primalbody-primalmind.com. I have my books, Primal Body, Primal Mind, my newest book, Primal Fat Burner, and I have an ebook called Rethinking Fatigue, which is what your adrenals are really telling you and what you're, you know, what you can do about it. And I also have an online year-long, you know, 52 week certification course called Primal Restoration that, uh, you know, I have not gotten a bad review on yet from anyone that has taken it. Um, and so there's a, there are a lot of resources though. I've got a ton of resources on my website, a lot of free stuff, a lot of uh, podcasts from my old radio show and, and uh, a lot of videos and talks that I've given. And I'll, I'll send you a couple links, you know, Peter, that you can uh, maybe add as, as, you know, bonus viewing for, for your, for your lovely audience. Awesome. I love what you do. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. And All thank right. you. Nora left me thinking about a lot of things. As subjects of civilization, we each have a complex network of ways in which we have been separated from the evolutionary expectations of our lives. 
It's hard for us to be healthy within the culture of civilization because it's so far off what we are adapted to, and it changes so fast that it becomes a moving target where even our genetic offspring can't even catch up to the changes. The compromises our culture forces us to make are ludicrous, ever-present, and ever-expanding. In every moment of our daily lives, it seems we make these trade-offs. Do I have the physical and emotional energy to cook a meal for myself after working long hours at my shitty job? Or is it easier for me to just buy cheap fast food? What do I do if I live in a food desert and can't afford to travel to buy higher quality food? Is the stress created from worrying about what I'm eating all the time worse for my body and mind than just eating whatever I want? With limited time in a day, should I focus on eating better or getting more exercise? How about getting less screen time and being outside more? The complexity of our situation can feel frustrating and hopeless at times. We all lead ridiculously complex lives, and only as individuals can we create a system that works for ourselves and our communities within these complexities. This is why I never give prescriptions for rewilding, or how to do it. I look for the expectations in evolution and biology, I look at what has worked and not worked, and I share it with others so that we can find our own paths, but help each other in a collective path. How each of us gets there is a deeply personal experience and process. But it can't be done alone. We have to rewild together. Today I'm going to leave you with two questions to ponder on your path of rewilding. First, how can we meet the expectations of our DNA today with as little compromise as possible? Second, as we walk away from civilization and rewild as much as each of us can, What are the plants and animals that each of us can hunt, gather, grow, and or steward in regenerative ways that can simultaneously meet the needs of optimal health? If I had the ability to live completely in the way my DNA expects, I would. But my life, like all of ours in civilization, is a compromise. I hope this episode has inspired you to think about what you eat, how it affects you, and what are the compromises that are not worth making. Thanks for listening. Check out the podcast notes for links to Nora's work and more. If you'd like to converse about the topics covered, I invite you to join the Rewilding Forum at rewild.com. If you like this episode, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you'd like to see this podcast continue to grow and flourish, become a financial supporter by following the link in my podcast notes. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you next time. (laughs) 